Jane Sullivan of CNBC. And to quickly introduce the other panelists, we have uh, Jean Bernard, who is Director of Research and Portfolio Manager at Kennedy Capital Management. Conrad Grodd, Vice President, uh, no, no, but that's right, I forgot. Um, with Laura Martin, Senior Analyst, uh, Needham and Company. Um, and uh, Steve uh, Brody is Assistant General Counsel, Regulatory and Government Affairs at Fubo TV. Um, Brian. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. Hey, good morning, everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, meeting a lot of cool people. Thanks for dialing up the perfect weather, Scott. I was in Jacksonville, Florida on Monday. It was 117 with the heat index. This is a little bit, it's a little bit better. Plus, I hate Florida State, so there was also that. Yeah. <laughs> Just I, I, half the room. I, 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 I know. All the, all the law. I met a couple last night, Seminoles. So it's, uh, welcome, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, there, there, oh, see, there we go. We got to do that stuff. Come on. Um, Scott was making a joke, but he kind of wasn't making a joke about the future of media because, Laura, I was going to kick it off with you and be like, this panel should actually be called the future of media? Question mark. <laughs> is there a future what, media? <laughs> please tell me, number one, I'm getting old, but I'm not dead yet. Tell me there is a future, and if so, what does it look like in five years? So the future of media is going to be fangs in five years. You can't compete against Apple, who has been incompetent at media, um, I think, to date, but they have $90 billion of cash flow, which buys them in, inexorable uh, optionality. And what's going to happen next is all these big fangs, so fangs are Facebook, Amazon, Google, the big tech. They all have traffic, but they don't have engagement. So what the, well, you know what drives engagement is film and TV, long form programming. And you can't compete against their 90 billion. Eventually they'll get their act together and decide that elongating engagement has got to be their primary alternative. Um, Amazon, similarly, unlimited cash. They're trying to drive an e-commerce business. And Disney isn't going to be big enough to compete, which means neither is Paramount or Warner Brothers. So we need more consolidation into bigger players that can try to compete with these big monoliths on the FANG side that have enormous free cash flow. So that's the future of media. It is bigger, it is more globally scaled, and it is both user-generated content and premium, which we do not have today, that intermixing. So that would be my prediction. Brian. And we'll get to AI in a second, Laura. Yep. But I, I want... Listen, I'm the, I'm the stock market channel guy, right? So the numbers, what Laura just said, you need to put into perspective. Apple's free cash flow at $90 billion is more than Disney's annual revenue. It is. Apple makes more profit than Disney makes any money. So it sounds like an, it's an, probably inevitable that an Apple, that an Alphabet, that an Amazon... Amazon's 538 billion in revenue, by the way. I know it's a lot of socks and stuff, but whatever. Are going to have to buy an ESPN? Okay. Yes. Um, no. Uh, uh, ESPN ish, Gene. So um, I, I'm the representative business person here. Just to let you know, what I do is I invest in companies. I put money behind business ideas. I look for competitive advantages. I look for growth, etc. I've been doing the communications sector for 30 years across distribution and content media, and I would say I've never seen vertical integration work. Full stop. So they, they what better. Do you, what do you mean vertical integration? <laughs> yeah. So content is fragmented, and platforms and distribution tend to be capital intensive or global in nature or whatever. So again, we can talk about AT&T, Time Warner. We can talk about Comcast Universal, et cetera, content, buying content and vertically integrating it with a specific platform uh, doesn't provide any advantages. Well, one of those two, <laughs> one of those two examples I think has worked out lovely, NBC yeah. Universal. Your uh, employer? My <laughs> His employer. Benevolent corporate overlord. <laughs> it's all good. Um, Stephen, listen, you, you're in the Fubo side, kind of the... I, it's fair to say I'm not going to call you a startup, but you're not Apple either. You're not, you're not ESPN. How, how do you, so you guys are in the mix. You guys are, everybody's fighting at Fubo, Roku, everything. How do you, how do you, how does this button work? You turn off. Oh, you got, oh, you just tap it. You don't have to hold it. Sorry about that. Um, very fancy. Uh, how do you see this whole thing shaking out, the future of media in three to five years? Yeah, what I see is that the companies that focus on consumers are going to be the ones that come ahead. And that's why I think Fubo every day focuses on what's best for consumers. How do we provide the content that consumers want? 
and one thing that we've seen that's important for consumers is sports. And so what we'll see in three to five years is a focus on sports entertainment continuing to grow. Uh, there's some synergies there with other industries as we see sports books, their business is growing around the country. We're gonna see sports forward uh, media producers and companies like Fubo growing. But also we're gonna see that companies wanna, that consumers rather, wanna have one point of access. They don't wanna scroll across the bottom of their television and select from six different or 10 different options for what they wanna watch. They wanna to go to companies like Fubo, open the app and be able to watch movies, television, sports, live entertainment, have the DVR functionality, have the fast channels. And I think that's where we're gonna see growth. And where we're gonna see fall off is some of these one-off uh, platforms where you only have a limited amount of content and you have to select from one of many in order to get everything you wanna watch. And Fubo is a virtual MVPD, which is like a skinny bundle. So it's just a, and it can cancel any time. So it's a competitor to cable, but it does have linear TV chain stations. Yeah, yeah but and Laura, I feel like the only thing skinny in the bundle is the profit. Because there is none. Okay. Right? Nobody's making any money. But, yeah, but, I, I but, think, but we'll make it up in volume, Stephen. Yeah, my dad always says that. We lose money on every sale, make up for it in volume. But what we have with Fubo is a path to profitability in the year 2025. And... Uh, to your point, I don't think it's a skinny bundle. We have over 160 channels even on our base bundle. So you have a lot of options for what you want to watch. And as a company, we have a path to profitability. It just and, and not going after Fubo, I would say, and Lori could chime in too as well. How do we pay? So let me just do a quick thing here. And ever, just raise your hand if you have cable television, direct TV, dish. That's, what was that about? Is that about 50%? I'd say 50. Okay. It's a lot higher than the national average. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So the, the business of cable TV and TV is very simple. If you don't know, and I'm going to make it very generic with the math, so Laura, please say that's wrong, and I get it. Look, imagine a pie chart with a peace sign, one-third, right? One-third of your bill goes to the Internet, one-third goes to, you know, Comcast as profit or whatever, and one-third, the rest goes to split amongst the channels like ESPN, Fox, MSNBC, et cetera. I know it's a very rough thing and not accurate, Laura. We're taking away one of those entire slices of pie. I, I just don't, uh, when people cut the cord, I just don't understand the economics right now. So the economics are bad. Every streaming company is losing money. Wall Street's screaming at these people. It's zero percent interest rates. Wall Street, which is who I represent, really, um, didn't care if you all you did is grow revenue because your cost of capital was zero. And we insist when we give you capital that you have a positive return. Well, if the cost of capital is zero for a decade because interest rates were low, we're like just grow revenue. And then on a dime, the problem with Wall Street is we have the right to change our mind. So as interest rates suddenly went up 500 basis points, they're now at seven percent. Um, we're like, no, 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 you have to have a return on capital, which means you now have to start generating cash flow, like overnight. And I had CEOs that had never worked, because they'd been CEOs less than 10 years, had never worked in an environment where they had to have a positive free cash flow. And the streamers all count. They were taking all of their sister subsidiary cash flow and putting it in a streaming business, which wasn't making money. Wall Street's like, fine, good idea, zero cost of capital. The minute capital started, bond rates got started going up, we're like, oh no, hard no. You need to have a 500 basis point you know, positive return on the cash you're using from us. And suddenly they're like, wait, who changed the rules? And I said, we did, and that's all right. And so we took down media stocks are down 60 to 70%, especially streaming companies. Comcast is higher. Okay, good for you, Brian. I hope you own equity. <laughs> it is, it's up. But I mean, and listen, we're, we're in a little bit of the weeds here, but you invited the CNBC guy, Scott, so what'd you expect? Mm -hmm. um, but, and I know most of you are policy, but what Laura's saying is critically important. I'm sure Jeannie can chime in. Yeah. Money is everything, right? And as you guys talk about policy and where this thing is going, there are gonna be companies you're talking about currently that will not exist in three years. Yep, we have a yes. sell on Meta. We think it might not exist in 10 years, but that's pretty controversial, I must say. <laughs> Meta's well, the new fancy name for Facebook, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I mean, I'll open the Pandora's box here, which is cable is losing subscribers because they've been regulated for X number of years of a mandated bundle. Um, and content is pro proliferated. There are lots of ways to create bundles now and open up for the consumer. The consumer has now got to choose between this forced big bundle or a bunch of little separate things. It would be, I would advise, remove all re regulation first around how content can or can't be bundled focus on the platforms being open everywhere, 
and let's see how that goes rather than moving to try to what, what regulate. Does that mean? What first. does that mean? Go into a little bit more on that, Jean. Um, I, well, I would just say, you know, again, this could be controversial, but when we look at local stations, government gave them licenses as a way of subsidizing local news and all of that. And then that was forced into a regulatory environment with cable that they have to carry and compensate. And between sports and local broadcasts and all of that, if you want to buy a cable bundle, you are taxed to um, pay for all of that at a very high rate. Whereas everybody out on the internet can put together their own content bundles, smaller versions of it, and chip around at the edge. So now people, the consumers are forced to buy a big bundle and or lots of little things, whereas maybe you put together, we could have the good content survive in either forum and be bundled appropriately if there weren't separate rules and let the media companies figure out how to do that in the way the consumer values. Um, so I say remove why regulation. Okay, first. why don't we just bundle all the bundles and call it cable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of making a joke, but if no. you add up everything now and nobody's making any money, you're probably paying this, if you if you subscribe into everything that everybody else is, Hulu, Netflix, Peacock, you add it up, you're probably paying, okay, you have a lot more options, I certainly understand that, but I think, you know, on the regulatory side, Stephen, you've got, we had 100, what, 9 million cable households 10 years ago, we're at 60 million, I think now, Laura, like, yeah, 64, probably going to 40, right, it's, it's just where the bottom is, and yet it feels like the regulatory stuff I read anyway, you can jump in. Everything is focused on like that industry and not enough on your side, which you're the grower and we're the decliner, but we're getting most of the regulatory scrutiny. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things to point out there. First of all, it's why people leave cable. I say this as someone who cut cable myself quite a while ago, and it's because cable was an inferior product. I had to pay for a box. I had to be locked into a contract. You had some cable companies that would have a two-year contract, but a one-year price guarantee. So you're signing with the idea that after one year, you're either committing to paying a contract termination fee or committing to pay whatever increase in price the cable company wanted, as opposed to Fubo, which gives you the, that group of channels. It's not just limited channels, but also allows you to back out any time before there's a price increase, but also follows through and makes sure that we provide a product and a service at a level that makes you want to stay with us. And then also, the technology is so far advanced. You have the opportunity to watch not just from your television with that box. And by the way, I remember when I had to get a box for every room. So I had cable with the, the DVR and some of the other functionality in the main room. And then in my bedroom, I could get limited channels included in that price. Then all of a sudden I was told, oh, you can't get those channels on, in any room where you don't have a box. Fubo allows you the optionality to get it on your phone, to get it on your computer, to get it on your smart TV, to get it anywhere in the country, and to get it for one price. And I think that's where we need to distinguish ourselves from cable and say it's not just putting everything together again with a different name. It's saying we're going to do this better. Now, as for the regulations... This panel brought to you by Fubo TV. <laughs> <laughs> as for the regulations, I think what we need to see is that technology has evolved and the regulations need to evolve. We can't say that this is the new cable and therefore we just need to apply the old regulations to what's happening now. So for example, there's some efforts underway with the FCC right now to say that companies like Fubo should have to negotiate with every individual cable, uh, every local station, because that's what historically cable companies have had to do. And the idea is that it's a different market and those requirements shouldn't exist simply because they used to exist for an older version and a different version of what's available today. Well, I think, and again, I, I am no pro on this topic. I have a law degree, but I do not practice. Um, but I do understand, and maybe this is a little bit down the weeds, Stephen, uh, this viewer choice coalition you guys are in. NBC's in it too, by the way, where the virtual MVPDs, they're fighting with states, especially California, because they have never met a tax they didn't like. They're trying to tax the virtual, the Fubos, the Rokus, whatever, as utilities, as I understand it, because there's, there's a right of way and there's a utility tax on your cable bill. You guys hate it. Towns want it because they, they, they they're afraid to lose revenue. What's the, is there a right mix here? Is zero tax the right answer, Stephen? Or can you, you know, it's not 5% of gross income, which is normally what it is, maybe half that. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally gonna say zero tax is the right answer. I also think we need to recognize that some of those taxes came about because these entities were given monopolies. 
So a cable company was told, you spend the money, you put in this wires, these wires, you have access to all these houses, these houses only have access to you. In exchange for that, here's a fee you pay. And I think that's a totally different dynamic than what we have. Now, there's the other part of that is the local negotiations, and that's what this pres Preserve Viewer Choice Coalition is about, saying that Fubo should be allowed to negotiate with Fox, and Fox should bring the local stations to Fubo, which has been effective. And like I said earlier, it's what's in the interest of the consumer. Because 97% of the consumers have access to, excuse me, consumers have access to 97% of their local channels. So trying to change the system is just creating a regulatory benefit for those local stations, not creating a benefit for the consumers. Well, and that's, I, I think from a business perspective, content and distribution are no longer combined or need to be combined. So we need to disaggregate how we think about media. And all of the capital intensity of it has, is all about the distribution and is now internet access. So whether or not the consumer chooses to buy content bundled with that provider is now a choice. There's plenty of other alternatives of how you might get something bundled. Uh, and I simply would say there's a lot of competition in um, content right now and types of content and the way it's offered. Um, and who bundles it and who does that. And so to have rules on one set separate from the rest, to me, just as a business person, doesn't make sense when I'm uh, evaluating business op options. And so if people are constrained in these odd ways, it distorts competition. But is there a, and and it even distorts the opportunity for a FUBO or for new business models. I, I'm coming at it, obviously, from, you know, Comcast is my parent company, so just keep that in mind. But I also <laughs> do use Apple TV, and I use a Roku device as well. So I've got cable at home, but I've got Apple TV as well. I've got Roku um, as it suits my needs. So is there, Gene, and Stephen, you can chime in, I'm sure, is there some compensation? Because we're the ones, Verizon, everybody else, spent tens and tens or hundreds of billions of dollars building the infrastructure behind it that enables the Wi-Fi that Fubo operates on. So is there, a, is there an economic justification you need some napkins over there? <laughs> is there an economic justification for some, as it pertains to regulation, when you look at the regulation, say, well, hey, listen, they, they're the ones that built it out. I mean, I, I can go ahead. I say yes. Yes, they have. Um, and again, it's a progression from whether or not they're getting paid for that in the price they can charge for broadband access versus whether it's bundled with TV services. And while the consumer hates to realize this, they were getting a bargain when it was a <laughs> yeah, duopoly that true. could bundle your content with that return. Let's <laughs> <laughs> hug it out. So Brian, I want to take I want to take the other side of what Gene's saying. So uh, basically, big media, and what I mean by that is Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Disney have become uninvestable because their top lines are not growing. And so if you buy a share today, the way, only reason you're going to be able to sell it a year from now is if revenue is higher and you sell at the same multiple. So if you have shrinking top lines, they become uninvestable. What you can do, though, is if you're Discovery and you buy scripts and you have a German CFO who triples the cost savings of whatever he promises Wall Street, guess what happens? Your revenue goes up because you bought something and now he can rip out costs for three years so he's got positive free cash flow improvement and positive earnings for share growth, investable. I, you know, I have, I have investors in the ecosystem that will invest in earnings per share growth. Now he buys Warner Brothers, same drill. His revenue goes up because he bought a new company and his CFO goes in and he rips out three times more costs than he's promised. So now he's gonna have free cash flow improvement, which is code for return on invested capital, and he's gonna have earnings per share growth, investable. But the only way to maintain investability, in my opinion, in this space is for these companies to continue to buy because his, their top lines are shrinking organically. And I think this includes the Walt Disney Company. So I think this industry has to get bigger 
to be investable by Wall Street and to access our capital. And by the way, you don't, don't think that we're alone because employees get paid in stock options. You, you don't keep the best people unless your stock is going up, which means Wall Street has to be buying your shares so that your employees are getting paid, not just their salary of 80,000 a year, but they're making money in their stock options. Otherwise, those employees are leaving media and you lose the best people and yeah, you the, need the best people. There's a good question here on the bottom, but I'm gonna sort of change it a little bit, Laura, which is, and I'm a car racing freak. I love, so I spend, uh, $60 a year to watch the Australian V8 Supercar Series. I spend $99 a year for the F1 app where I can watch all the drivers. And everyone's got their hobbies and their interests. And so, you know, is there ever a day where, because even Fubo and Hulu TV and Google TV, YouTube TV, th they're not truly a la carte. I mean, I still got to pay 80 bucks a month for Home and Garden 2, right? Which I'm never watching, right? Even though my mom loves it. Is the question on a la carte? Is, are we ever going to go to a day where I could just... Literally, I can no. just pay four dollars a month and have CNBC and no. nothing else. No, because bundles are twice as profitable. Anything that's bundled has twice the economic return so on capital. So true a la carte will never happen. Never happen. And you're seeing rebundling like, now. Except, right. except you, buying you're stuff off Apple TV, renting. I, I yeah, still, you I can do buy that. a DVD. Like you can buy a DVD. Like I want Philadelphia Story. It's on no streaming service. I can buy that DVD. That's an unbundled product. Yeah, but on Apple TV, I can also buy a movie for like nine yeah. ninety nine, right? If it's a movie my son wants to watch eight times, it's a better economic decision for yeah. me to buy cars for twelve bucks yeah. than it is for me to rent it, you know, three times at four ninety nine. Yeah. But, but true no. a la carte will nope. never occur. Bundling is too important, and by the way, it confuses the consumer. I don't know if you guys have noticed. If you talk to any of your constituents. Consumers are angry that they cannot find the content they want. New Yellowstone is on this channel on streaming service, and the, re the library is on a different streaming service. It's a nightmare. So bundling makes the consumer choices easier, and it makes the economics twice as profitable. Okay, let's let's move on. There's a strike, writer strike, actor strike. It's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. And Laura lives in LA, so I know you're you're, you're dialed in with the with everybody personally. Um, any movement? On, they're, they're talking, mm -hmm. but this is a huge deal. And the longer it goes, and I don't know who's right. I have no opinion other than people should get paid to create good content, period. Hard stop. And streaming is screwing everything up, just like it did in m music. That's why you got to pay $1,000 to see Taylor Swift, because nobody's buying the albums, right? They stream it, and she gets half a cent or whatever the number is, so she's got to charge $1,000 a ticket to make money, because it used to be the opposite in music, by the way. Um, how does the strike impact everything that we're talking about? So two things. Um, one is Wall Street likes the strikes. We would like them to go on longer. Why? Because um, both Paramount and Warner Brothers came on their quarterly call for June and said, every month the strikes go on, we generate an extra free cash flow of $100 million because we have no cost of goods sold. We cannot make content. And they're both over levered. They both have way too much leverage. Warner Brothers has 4.6 times leverage. Investment grade is two times. So every month that this goes on, they suddenly have an extra 100 million of free cash flow the street wasn't expecting, and they're paying down debt, which is great because it lowers their risk of financial distress. So guess what? Their equity price goes up. So Wall Street likes the strikes for that reason. The other thing is, uh, we wrote a piece called Netflix is Playing Disney, and that was code for Netflix invented streaming and didn't pay out any residuals. The old world, meaning Disney and Warner and Paramount, all pay out residuals to their actors. And guess what? Come fall, the strikes most benefit Netflix because now their main competitor should be the new season's um, content on ABC, NBC, and Fox all shut down. No new content. So now people are watching Netflix more because there's no new content on broadcast. So these strikes are hurting the traditional guys that used to pay residuals because Netflix is saying we don't want to pay residuals on streaming. So like Netflix is playing the rest of the old industry, in my opinion, because by the way, when they're doing strikes, all they're negotiating is the 25-year-old who's new in the business. The minimums, that's not who much these companies spend money on. Like when you watch one of these Avenger films, you've heard of the musician, the guy that runs music, you've heard of the guys who, the actors on stage, you've heard of everybody on that screen. None of these guilds are negotiating those people's rates. Those people's have talent agents. So 90% of the cost of the industry are the names you've heard of that are on these big films or on these big TV shows. The guilds only negotiate the starting rate, the minimum rate for the lowest paid people in their guilds, which really isn't sort of relevant to the economics of the industry in my opinion. 
Yeah, I don't want to take away from the strike. That, that's a very serious issue and impacting a lot of people. But for our company in particular, because we're sports focused, we are largely insulated from the impacts of that. Our customers are coming to see the games and the games are still available. So it uniquely positions us. It's certainly something we're keeping an eye on, but it's something that affects us much less than it affects any of our competitors because it affects both what we provide and why people come to our product to, to see that content. I think you benefit. I think you benefit. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I would say, I would point out that the strike only affects scripted content, uh, longer form, all of that. So when we talk about media and content, there are a lot of other forms. And whether it's um, the uh, uh, documentary. I'm working because I'm yeah. new. I'm yeah, new. I'm news. I mean, news, yeah. news sports, sports, documentaries, the. Um, user generated. The user generated side, all Gaming, the. Video what, are, games? what are all right. the people called that do the their actors on what's supposed to be their real lives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're actually not part of the That's guild. true, they're reality. They're reality, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not really ra reality, but. Um. Have you ever watched <laughs> Below Deck? Because I mean, <laughs> they're clearly not actors. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, there is a ton of content out there just not scripted longer form while this is being negotiated in typically the right way. It's a union, it's contract negotiations, and this will get figured out no matter how long it takes until it hurts both sides. And yes, the Paramounts, et cetera, can win because they don't have a cost for months or a year or whatever it takes, but they won't have a business if they don't figure out a business model, including the employees that create it. So well, the, 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 we're miss, I think we're missing the giant, not elephant in the room, a herd of a pod of elephants, or whatever they're called, in the room, and that is sports. NBA, five years, 2.7 billion. Next year it's up, it's probably gonna go for five to six billion. Literally a double. Look at the NFL, look at Lionel Messi's landmark deal with Apple TV, which is just killing it, and he's killing it, by the way, keeps scoring it left and right. But Laura, I mean, sports, and Fubo, you're sports focused, I'm, no offense, you're gonna have to raise your, your monthly rate because otherwise you're going to be putting like, I, I, I don't know, like Canadian curling or something on at 8 p.m. Brian no Sullivan Racing. A curler. Brian Sullivan Racing. That's who it's going to be you on football. You know Fubo. what? I'm good, and, I, and I, there's some good crashes. The crashes are all views. But, Laura, sports is this massive thing, and I just don't see how, like, even ESPN or Disney is going to be able to – it's going to be – I think in five years I'm going to watch all my sports on Amazon, Apple, to your yeah. point, or – Google. Right. So two things. One is this is this is my answer to your ESPN question you asked up front. I think the reason Bob Iger has said he's breaking ESPN to a separate line item is he's going to go to the NBA and he's going to say, look, you can take those big checks from Amazon and Apple because they can afford to pay sort of unlimited cash to win the bid. Um, or you can have 10 percent of ESPN and we'll pay half as much as they did. That's a better deal because yeah. now they're creating equity value because they own part of the yeah, underlying property. They're going to have property. to spread the risk. I think, and if you look at, again, going back to racing, because it's what I know best, NASCAR model, right? NASCAR, and nobody here, does anybody here watch NASCAR besides me? Thank you. I knew I liked you. I saw you in the hallway. I was like, that woman is Nobody really watches you, Brian. <laughs> so anyway, NASCAR is on Fox half the year and NBC half the year. Spread, look at the NBA, TBS, mm -hmm. TNT, kind of spread that around a little bit, I think that's where you're going for. Yeah. The, the economic risk, even the numbers we're going to be getting with sports are so massive, especially like NBA, probably a double on the cut. I just don't see. And so I guess the regulatory issue would be here, and Stephen chime in or people could ask a question, is should it be legal for – let's say Amazon buys the rights to some TV thing, right, or in, in NFL thing. So now I have to have NFL, I have to have Amazon Prime if I want to watch the Chargers lose. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, should yeah. that be allowed? Should I have to have something, because I got a C minus an antitrust law, but I think that was called tying. Like should I, should that be legal? Yeah, I, I think as long as it's an even playing field as to the companies acquiring the content that is fair. Where I think we're seeing a problem is if you Google, how do I watch this game? And even if this game is available. Or Bing it. You can Bing. 
You can Bing it. Yeah. Good, but if you use Yahoo, Google, Lycos. But if you use Google, you're only told about YouTube TV, even if that content's available on competitors to YouTube TV. Oh. So that's where I think the antitrust okay. concerns come in, okay. is when there's a company like Google only telling you about the availability of their content. That's different than saying, we're going to go to the market with this content and allow different companies to bid for it. That's yeah, so point. let's say I go, let's do it. Somebody out there, Google right now, or Bing, whatever, probably Google for the example, how much does Fubo TV cost per month? I it's wonder if an ad for YouTube TV is the first thing they see. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's fair to have an ad because, quite frankly, I believe our product's superior and let the consumers choose. But I think that's different than saying we're not even going to allow you to see Fubo. Well, you can see. What do you mean you can't see? What I'm saying is when you go to see, when, my issue from a regulatory perspective, is when there's a company that says, we're gonna, there's a consumer wants to see how they could watch content, the company comes back and says, the search engine comes back and says, you can only watch it on our, on our channel, on YouTube TV, on our video distribution platform. Or it just upranks its own content. Up, it upranks for sure, but even sometimes it excludes competitors altogether. Okay. And that's a huge concern. Unless I'm an investor, because that sounds like Alphabet would be a good, good investment, Gene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, sports has been used to build businesses off of it throughout the media landscape for decades here, Fox being one of the first ones who built the Fox channel yeah. off of buying the rights to broadcast sports. Um, the difference has been, historically, most of these platforms were broadly distributed so um, the consumer could find access to it or make one choice. So I actually, it, this is not my realm. I think from a business point of view, I would argue for open access and competitive rights to bid for and all of that. But I would say maybe there is a consumer protection policy here or thought process that could go on because I know the consumer in me is definitely frustrated with having to make 10 different choices of how to watch my one sport. Let's be, it's, you're not lying. Listen, I work in TV and I love my company, but let's be clear, it has gotten annoying. It's hard to find stuff. Right. That's true. Right? Am I right? Like it's, I want, where's, finally I just but, give up and you know, go outside but, and play but with my son. But obviously Fox, Fox, <laughs> Fox brought, and so maybe there's the good outcome, but um, the Fox broadcast was built on it. ESPN was built on creating a, a you have to have cable to watch some of your sports games. So now we're just going to different internet platforms that may do the same, although, again, I would go back to, I don't know why Apple would need that. They've already got us. Ah, so. but it's gonna get even, <laughs> Gene, it's gonna get even more complicated because you have this company called X. It used to be called Twitter, and this guy named Musk, and he's trying to turn X, which is now run by my friend and former colleague, Linda Yaccarino, head of ads. A uh, big upgrade for Linda, I mean, we miss her. It was a big loss for us. She's a uh, lovely and a tremendous person. Penn State Nittany Lion. For those, any of you Nittany Lion, thank you. There you go. What's in that cup? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're Penn State. Um, and they're trying to turn that basically into a TV network in a way. They've got this Carlson guy on there, right? And he's got some stuff. That's got to be a model. The regulatory landscape that you guys are talking about every day, and, and some of your, some of the people you work for, how do I say this politely? We're old when I live loosely debuted, I, and now they're, but that said, that's okay. Um, it's gonna be hard to explain the, re the changes in media, I think, especially with things like X. Brian, I wanna talk about generative AI, in specifically regarding to X. So I think generative AI, I know regulators hate size, and there's this anti-big tech thing. I don't think you guys know what big is, because I think what happens next with generative AI is the more data you have, the better your training models are. And these large language models have a trillion inputs. So not only the cloud guys get stickier, because once you build an app on one of these large language models on Google Cloud or on AWS or on ChatGPT, which is OpenAI over at Microsoft, you can't move, because you'd have to start over, right? So the more data, whoever has the most data is gonna have the best outcomes, and whoever has cloud is gonna be stickier. So it's winner take all with no churn. So I actually think the size of what we think is big today is about to get dwarfed. I think 10 years from now, the size will be, and it's the only way America stays ahead, my opinion. 
because there's every venture capital dollar that we're talking to right now is going in to funding kids that are dropping out of Harvard to create the next generator of AI enable. And I have a, I have a data source I want to tell you about this. I have I cover five Israeli companies. Every one of them is using generative AI. And when you allow the generative AI to make the headline, your click-through rate from by consumers goes up seven percent. If you let the generative AI make the the image, like for me, if it's a woman, I'm more likely to click on it. And if it's Brian, if it's a sports car, he's more likely to click on it. The image changing, if you let the generative AI submit the image, it goes up five percent, the click-through rate by the consumer. If you let the generative AI do both the headline, and it goes at 15%. So it's more, right? Seven plus five is 11, but if you let it do both, the click-through rate goes up 15%. So who's using generative AI now, right now, are some of the 59 million people on YouTube. The fastest adapters will be these entrepreneurs on YouTube who use tech to write their scripts and do their voice moderation and do their over narration and be more active to generate more content to get more followers. So tech-enabled user, you know, individuals on, and they will become a more impactful source against whoever, th when the strikes go back to work. Because they're going to be scripted, and they're going to be using a bunch of people in a room, and versus letting generative AI make more of the content. So I actually think user-generated content becomes more impactful because it adopts generative AI first in a distributed basis. Well, we, you guys all out there better get ahead of the regulation on this. I, do you see that story from New Zealand? And I believe it's true. Again, I'm just going to say it because who knows these days. It was somebody asked this. AI platform to create a cocktail, okay. and the cocktail was poisonous. It would oh. kill the drinker. Oh, okay. Uh, right? Like, there's, it's like self-driving cars. They're great 90% of the time, but it's the other 10% you got to be, when it drives into wet concrete or into oncoming traffic. I feel like we're there. It's, it's going so quickly, Laura. It's getting, I, I just worry Congress is not out ahead of it enough. You know what I mean? But the problem, Brian, it's like Matthew's answer. Like, if you really want to save the social, d mitigate, the, moderate the social negatives, you'd put a restriction of you can't use it unless you're 18 years old. Well, you know what that would have? It would have put Snap out of business, and today it would put YouTube, TikTok out of business, because they have 70% of under 25-year-olds. So you would put entire companies out of business. You would not affect Facebook. That is not where people under 18 are anymore. But AI is just scraping all the content on TikTok and Snap and everything, right? What people say and creating this collective consciousness among the masses. X does yeah. it, Twitter does it with words. Yeah, that's true. And they just yeah. collect. So you can manipulate that, right? Mm -hmm. If you can boost the algorithm on TikTok to make sure this thing, which may or may not be true or partly true, and now AI is learning from something that's a lie. But it's a trillion inputs, Brian. I mean, it's a trillion. So, I mean... Ugh. Really, I, I mean, mean, how much? How many li times does it have to be lied for the algorithm know, you know, to learn wrong? Build big computers and do a lot of stuff. I don't. Mm. I don't know. Maybe I'm way off base. Mm. What do you think, Gene? Because I, I'm contractually obligated to say AI 12 times a day now <laughs> on CNBC. <laughs> well, and unfortunately, as a growth investor, I'm obligated to listen to it. 12 times a day. <laughs> but it's like um, Burger but, King on their yeah. earnings calls, like we're using AI. I'm like, just make the burger better. <laughs> Yeah, no, obviously as investors, this is a productivity tool that we're looking for all the opportunities to invest behind that and for who can take advantage of it and use it. So um, I, I think that's still completely unknown and to be watched, um, and I have no input on what the negatives could be. I'm sure there's tons of them. If you were going to give some <laughs> advice from the financial side to the regulatory people that are in this audience, Gene, what would it be? Hmm. Interesting. I'll let you think about that yeah. one, Laura. Yep. What's the most important question we are not, I did not ask? I will ask it in the most offensive way to offend everybody in this room. Is regulation relevant in a technology first in industry? And what I mean by that is consumers moved, especially consumers under 25, moved from Facebook to Snap, so Instagram recreated Snap, and now they've moved to TikTok. Consumers move faster than regulators. Wall Street took $300 billion out of Google's uh, market cap the day it demoed Bard after ChatGPT had gotten there first because so, there are people on Wall Street who thinks that ChatGPT or let's just call it these large languages will put Google search out of business. That is one of the conversations I have every day. So Wall Street reacts faster, um, consumers react faster, and competitors react faster. Like in theory, Google has been ahead of, of AI for the last decade. Okay, but ChatGPT gets to market first? Like WTF, how is that possible? So competitors, consumers, and Wall Street all act faster 
as regulators. I wrote a piece that said, buy the Red Cross, not Amazon, because neither of them make money. Because the guy was making no money. He had $5 billion of revenue, um, and he made 2% margins. Like, that's ridiculous. He shouldn't be given capital. And the stock was dead money for a year because he shouldn't be given capital to have no returns. So the point is, there are, there are factors that sort of regulate some of this behavior that are much faster than Washington, D.C. And I think Washington, D.C. has unintended consequences because they're structural that actually usually hurt the smaller would-be innovator, not the incumbent that it can afford the phalanx of lawyers. That's my opinion. But 90% of the audience probably lives in, like, Arlington. In the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said I was going to insult everybody. Right? <laughs> Hanging out at Wilson's. <laughs> You know, I, I, so D.C. used to be a small town. I grew up outside of D.C. Now it's the richest town in the world. Like, it, it's unbelievable. But that's, that's a different... There's people who live in Winchester where I went to high school that commute to D.C. every day, and it's like 90 miles. Um, Jean, you had time to think about your quest. the question. Yeah, no, I What did. financial <laughs> advice? Because it's different worlds, but I like to joke, only half-jokingly, that D.C. is the capital of capital now. Yeah. You've got to go where the money is, Laura. Yeah, I always do. No. <laughs> That's why we're in Aspen. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that uh, media and government are always interlinked because it's obviously an important forum for government people through the media and to the people and all that. But economically, media businesses are under a tremendous amount of pressure if they're not one of the large internet platforms. Um, and there's a lot of innovation that's been going on, but a lot of struggling smaller business models. And I can tell you, I invest in small cap growth US companies. That's what we're looking to build up, these smaller companies that can become the next big ones. There's not a lot of promising opportunities in the media space. Um, so I would say- But yet somehow all the founders and executives get insanely rich. Yes. At companies that never make a dime of profit because they pay everybody in stock but now I'm going on a different rant. A different, a different rant, but I would just say the worry about it, I wouldn't be looking at the corporate side and the concern about profits or the concern about, uh, I, I would just be looking at it from other policy issues, but I, the, it's very competitive. So if we're worried about competition, that's not the issue. Yeah, and Stephen, I'll, we're going to wrap it. I'll give you a final comment because you're the Vegas dude also and like sports gambling and sports TV. I, I, is there a day where... I know I can go on my fan duel or whatever it may be and bet live during a game, but will I be able to bet through the TV soon? I don't know about soon, but I think that day is going to come. And what's unique to sports wagering is it's regulated on a state level. So what you're going to see is that possibility in select jurisdictions. Uh, some of the more progressive regulators are going to allow that to happen first. And then, like sports betting in general, we'll see if that success happens, and if it does, we're going to see that ability to gamble through your TV proliferate across the country. I also, I, I just wanted to bring up one point about technology to tie this together. We're talking about learning from the internet, and I think what we also need to recognize is that we're learning from the consumer. And so where you're going to see that benefit the consumer is when you have this opportunity to watch hundreds of channels, the content provider is going to say, we know you have hundreds of channels, and you can pick from any of them. But this is the content we think you're going to like. And the companies that get better at figuring out that answer are the ones that are going to succeed. And there's, there's a bifurcation. One is going to say, one part of that is what content already exists and what have you already watched? And the other is going to say, how can we scrape what's happening today, what's happening live, and feed you content from games or news or entertainment that's something you want to watch? So it's not saying we know that th these 10 movies exist and because you watched the same seven as these other people, we're going to tell you these other three. We're going to be able to say, because you watch this content, we know from today's broadcast what you want to watch. Sometimes I just watch shit I don't want to watch, and then just to mess with the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up on this awesome. I'm going to stick around for another panel. Some great questions, by the way, that came in that are probably more appropriate for the next panel as far as a little more media on the regulatory side. So we're not, we're not, I'm not ignoring your questions, 
But I think some of them, are like Lena Khan and Antitrust, might be better for the next panel, Brad, which is all VC. I just want to answer this one. I do not think they'll put Google out of business because I think Google has the smartest people. It just doesn't think the external world is how to use it, but it is a good reactor. And these smart people don't want to be outpaced. So what it needs is a competitor to introduce something. And then they've got the founder back at Google working on AI. Like, that's unfortunate. He shouldn't have to come back. But they are really good respondents. They really do think they're smart, and I think they are smart. They just need to be more product-oriented, in my opinion. So I, I, do, I do think that every time a competitor comes out, they will get their ducks in a row, and they'll have a competitive product. But unfortunately, the catalyst has to be from outside. So I don't think they'll die. They'll just be driven by other competitors doing things first. All right. Big hand for our panel. Laura Stephen Dean. Probably take a short little break and then we'll turn it quick, I guess. Right. Yeah, the... exactly. Everybody stay right here. We're going to get the next Can I get a coffee? Going. You can. Because I'm not amped.